Hello, all. very good. Good morning to all of you. So, guys, how's the things going on? All fine. So nice to meet you. Welcome back to another session of our YT Live. Welcome back to IFAS team. So, guys, in this session, we are going to discuss the contemporaries of Chaucer because it is very important, guys. It's very important. There were lots of writers who lived during the period of Chaucer. Okay, so that period of Chaucer was a flourishment of English literature, English language, Middle English language. And at that time, we have lots of wonderful, most granted, most discussed writers. So it is very important to know about that writers too. So guys, in this video, we are going to discuss about the contemporaries. Who were the contemporaries who lived during the era of Chaucer and who followed the writing style of Chaucer. But in brief, Chaucer influenced whom? So who were influenced by Geoffrey Chaucer? Let's start. Without any delay, let's start. All right. So, the contemporaries of Chaucer. We have the first one who is William Langland. Who is William Langland? So, William Langland was a 14th century English poet known for his work, Piers the Plowman. So, William Langland was one of the contemporaries of Jack. Geoffrey Chaucer and he wrote his famous work Piers the, Piers the Plowman. He is believed to have been born in the West Midlands of England around 1330. So around 1330 which means that is the 14th century. So around 1330 William Langland who was known as the contemporary of William, sorry, Geoffrey Chaucer who wrote the Piers Plowman. And he likely lived in the late 1380s or early 1390s. So we are not sure about little much, a little much is known about William Langland. And we are not sure about his death year. And he lived likely around 1380s or 1390s. So that's all about William Langland's biography. But it's not important that William Langland's biography, it is, it is not important. But important is, important thing is Pierce Plowman. The work, the Pierce Plowman. So William Langland was a 14th century English poet known for his work, what Pierce Plowman. And this is the work. Piers the Plowman. This is the cover picture of Piers the Plowman of that work. Okay, so it was written by P William Langland and translated by Peter Thurton. So this is something Piers the Plowman. That is, this is the story of a plowman and this is the story of how the plowman dreams and in his dream there is a vision of Christ. Okay, so this is something about which is related to the land, farming and nature related. Along with that land, we have to know about the story inside Piers the Plowman. That is the vision of, uh, vision of the Plowman about the Christ, his cross and such kind of biblical things are mentioned in this work. Okay, then... So moving on to the poem, the poem's central character is named Will. The vision of the Pierce Plowman, we have a central character, his name is Will, who falls asleep on a fair field, on a fair field full of folk. So, full of folk, we have a fair field inside that poem. He falls asleep in on a fair field where full of folk. And has a series of visions that reveal various aspects of Christian life and society in medieval English. So, it reveals various aspects of Christian love. 
life how christianity developed how christianity influenced during that time and the christian period of that that society the mindset of society christian life of medieval english period then the poem is divided into several parts of or visions so we have that is version we have several parts or version with the most famous be being with the most famous being the a b and c text so the poem is divided into mainly three texts that is a text b text and c text it sorry c text so both these three texts reveal about what the peers the plowman story or the christian life of medieval society it is also an allegorical and dream vision theme see guys in italian period chaucer used to write the poems mainly on dream vision style right we have the house of fame parliament of fowls and the book of duchess so these are dream vision poems so chaucer's dream vision poems influenced william langland that's why he wrote such a kind of poem in a dream vision model okay then yes then the poem's central character so we saw this one just a moment So the character Piers the Plowman, after whom the poem is named, is a humble plowman who represents the ideal Christian life. Right. So this is a poem about a humble plowman named. So Piers the Plowman, after whom the poem is named. So the plowman's name is Piers. So that's why this poem is known as Piers the Plowman. Okay, so he represents the ideal lifestyle, ideal Christian lifestyle. Okay, ideal Christian lifestyle. He becomes a symbol of Christian virtue and is contrasted with various allegorical figures and characters who embody different moral and social qualities. So he represents, he represents the ideal life of Christian life, ideal life that is Christian life and he is the symbol of Christian virtue. He holds the virtue of Christianity and is contrasted with various allegorical figures. Okay, so he is a symbol of various, uh, what, he is a symbol of Christian virtue and he is contrasted with various allegorical figures and character who embody different moral and social qualities. Though these characters and their interactions, the poem explores the themes such as the nature of sin, the corruption of the church and society. So, Though this poem upholds the virtue of Christian life or the allegorical figures, this poem also explores what the theme such as the nature of sin. The nature of sin. So we have seven sins depicted in, my, in our Bible. That is just like lust, what gluttony, sloth, wrath, such kind of things. Okay. So here... It is, it also explores the theme such as the nature of sin, the corruption of the church. Okay, so that time in Chaucer's Canterbury tale also, we can see the corruption of church, the corrupted clergymen. Okay, such kind of things, such kind of practices did, did during 14th century. That is the medieval English was a period of corrupted church and corrupted clergymen. So, such kind of themes are also explored in Pierce the Plowman and society. So, how the medieval English society could be. So, that kind of things are explained in this. So, 
the search for truth and the path of salvation is also a true of is also a theme of this poem the search for truth the pierce the plowman is searching for the truth and what the path for salvation also the path for salvation who am i salvation right who am i realizing what is the purpose of our life realizing the inner i that is salvation self salvation so that kind of things are also explored in this poem okay then john gower next next writer is john gower john gower was a 14th century english poet and contemporary of geoffrey chaucer <coughs> sorry so he is also a contemporary of geoffrey chaucer known for his significant contributions to middle english literature while he may not be as famous as chaucer gower's works have their own unique significance and are important for the society for the study of english language and culture during his time so john gower was not that much uh, fame as chaucer because at that time chaucer was the ultimate famous writer but john gower's works was an important study of the language how middle english language developed how they used that language and culture during his time so his works were the reflection of the development of language and the culture of medieval society so moving on to his work john gower was born about john gower john gower was born about around 1330 same period of william langland likely in kent england kent was a village in england although he exact birth although his exact birthplace is not known with certainly okay so the, about this work about this writers the biography is little known okay not little known a little known he came from a prosperous family and received a good education which included a knowledge of latin and french see again the knowledge of latin and french i i said you i would i told you guys that would during that time even though mid, the middle english was developed it was a transitional period of old english or sorry of middle english they considered latin and french as a pious or most prestigious languages so thus john gower the man got a good education a good education which included in, a, in the knowledge of latin and french that was a common for education of educated elite of his era so common for the educated elite of his era not the point those who are studying french and latin it was considered as the elite people okay that's why in canterbury tales the prior she knows the french okay she speaks the french language fluently which means she has to say when she she had to would uh, pretend that i am from elite class that's why she is speaking okay so such kind of things important the superiority of french and latin was so high during that time then yeah then john goes style and influence Gower's writing is characterized by its moral and didactic themes. So, moral and didactic themes were the most, uh, what, uh, most important themes of John Gower. Okay, what moral and didactic themes? Sorry. Actually, yeah. So 
yeah john goes writing is characterized by by its moral and didactic themes making the works valuable for understanding the moral and social concerns of his era so that was the period so john goes writing styles was the reflection of that medieval society he wrote in both middle english and latin okay why he got a well a good education in both french sorry, both french and latin so that's why he wrote in both middle english and latin reflecting the bilingual nature of sorry reflecting the bilingual nature of educated discourse in medieval england so reflecting that is the bilingual nature that was the time of bilingualism bilingual means what bilingual means knowing two languages right so either you can write in latin or in english it was french also so the thing is you can choose the language either it is in latin if you know latin then you can go with the latin language if you know french then you can also go with french language french and it is also very important they consider that it is very also it is also very important to write in medieval english or middle english too okay so yeah he wrote both in middle english and latin reflecting the bilingual nature of educated discourse in medieval england gower's style is considered more conservative and moralizing than chaucer's so gower's style this john gower's style was more conservative and more moralizing than chaucer's so that's why his poems were moral and didactic then who was so chaucer's canterbury tale is often seen as a more innovative and so chaucer's uh, canterbury tale is often seen as a more innovative and humorous work compared to gower's more didactic approach so even though john gower was influenced by chaucer chaucer's canterbury tale was somewhat satirical and somewhat what light but john gower was very strict in his didactic approach so that's the thing all right his literary works the so john gower is very much influenced by the didactic approach of poems so that's why his poems were the direct instructions or direct etiquettes of the themes which is related to the medieval society gower is best known for his three major works of middle english the first one is Confucio Amantis. Okay, so Confucio Amantis, that is the love verse confession. Okay, Confucio Amantis, that is the love verse confession. Next one is the Vox, sorry, Vox Clementis. Next one is what? Vox Clementis, and this uh, translation is the voice of the crier. Then we have another poem that is. Speculum meditantis, speculum meditantis, the mirror of the meditator. Okay, the mirror of the meditator. So we have two poems. The, the, they are the Confucius Amantis and Vox Clementis and Speculum. Then Speculum Meditantis. Okay. So the love was confession, the voice of the crier, and the mirror of the meditator. The mirror of the meditator. All right. So let's see some points about his works. So guys, in our bash life, definitely we will uh, see, we will discuss about this work in detail in this live session. I'm not discussing about in detail. Okay. The so speculum meditantis is essentially a mirror of or reflection of the human condition okay so that is specular meditandis it is essentially a mirror or reflection on the human condition it provides the moral and ethical 
guidance through stories, examples and reflections. So how he is, uh, he is reflecting the human condition? Through ethical guidance. That's why it is known as a didactic poem. Ethical guidance. Through stories, examples and reflections. The themes in Speculum Meditandus are often concerned with sin, repentance and pursuit of virtuous life. So, the themes in Speculum Meditandus were with concerned with sin, with repentance and the pursuit of virtue, virtuous life. Gauru's work draws from a range of sources. So, this work was uh, this work was written by referring a lots of books, lots of resources. Okay, so Gauru's so that's why Gauru's John Gauru's works work draws from a large of sources including classical literature, biblical stories and medieval legends also. So, classical literature, we can see the characters, the themes or the incidents from classical Greek or Roman literature and biblical stories. It is also related with Christ, Genesis and the biblical stories and medieval legends. So, Medieval legends such as Geoffrey Chaucer to convey its moral lessons. So, in order to convey his moral lessons, in order to convey his moral lessons, John Gower draws a vast resources. Okay, from Greek classical literature, biblical stories, and medieval uh, legends. Okay, so that is specular meditandis. Then. Sorry. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Next one is Confessio Amantis. Next one is what? Confessio Amantis. The title translate the lover's confession. Okay. Confessio Amantis means what? The lover's confession. This work is a long narrative poem consisting of approximately 33,000 lines. So, this is a long narrative poem. Okay, this is a long narrative poem consisting of 33,000 lines and is written in the form of word poetic confession. The confession, poetic confession. The poet is telling, the lover is telling he is confessing the thoughts or the experiences or the feelings to the reader. The poem is structured as a dialogue between a lover and his confessor. So, we have two characters in this poem, a lover and a confessor. So, the lover is confessing to that confessor who happens to be the god of love, that is Cupid. Okay, so we have a reference here, reference of Cupid here, we have a reference of Cupid here. So, Cupid is what? Cupid is who? The God of Love. Okay, so that's why he draws the figures, he draws the themes from classical uh, word works, such as Greco-Roman works. So, Cupid, Venus, such kind of gods can, we can see in Greek or Roman classical works. Okay. So, there is a reference of Cupid here. So, where we have a love theme, it is related with Cupid. Cupid is the god of love. Alright. Then, next one is, the lover confesses his sins. So, about the poem. The lover confesses his sins of love and seeks guidance and absolution from Cupid. In this work, the, the lover, he confesses to the confessor who is the god of love, Cupid. And seeks guidance and absolution from Cupid. Each book of the poem deals with different aspects of love, ethics and human behavior. 
So each poem, each poem is depicting what the different aspects of love, ethics and human behavior. So it is also a love poem. It is also a didactic poem. It explores themes of love, morality, social criticism. So it explores the themes of love, morality and social criticism often using allegorical tales. Guys, it explores the themes of love. Why? It is a confession about lover and social criticism. How a lover should be. How? What are the sins he did? Okay. So, morality. A person, as a person, ex expect other than a lover. Okay. Other than a lover, he is a person. So, ex as a person, what should he hold? What should be he followed? as a social figure that is societal social criticism often using allegorical tales so this work confession amandis is all also using the allegorical tales and stories from various sources to illustrate its points so it also uses the word sources to illustrate its points from various allegorical tales and stories so this is confession amandis so guys, got the idea about two works of John Gower? Any doubts? Guys, any doubts? Thank you so much, Pratik. Thank you. Nice teaching, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, how do the things going on, Pratik? All well? All well? All right. Okay, fine. So, moving on to the next point. Okay, moving on to the next point. That is another work that is Vox Clementis. That is Vox Clementis. Okay. So, it is a Latin poem. Please note that. Vox Clementis is written in Latin. Okay, so your homework in which language the Confession of Amandis is written? Okay, in which language the Confession of Amandis is written? That's your homework. So do find it and tag me in the comment box. Okay, so Vox Clementis is a Latin poem. So it is written in Latin. And by English poet John Gower and it is one of the Gower's major works and consists of a series of elegiac poems with written in Latin hexameters. So guys, what is the importance of this poem? It is one of the Gower's major works and consists of series of elegiac poems. So this Vox Clementis consists of so much elegiac poem. That is the thing. So, Vox Clementis consists of so much elegiac poems written in Latin hexameters. Next point is, it is written in Latin hexameters. Okay. So, the Vox Clementis translates the voice, the voice of one crying out in English. So, Vox Clementis is translated to the voice of one crying out crying out so the voice of one crying out is a latin work that is vox clementis by john gover and it consists of series of elegiac poems written in latin and along with that latin hexameters the meter the metrical form is it is written in latin hexameters okay all right, Pradik. All right, others also. Okay, fine. Next one. The poem is written in amazing, in a amazing, sorry, in a moralizing and didactic style. Obviously, he was a writer. He was a writer who writes, who wrote the poems about the morals and didactic style, right? And it reflects Gower's concerns about the state of England 
during 14th century. So that is the theme of this poem, that is Vox Clementis. Okay, so it concerns about the state of England during 14th century. Guys, in the 14th century, we have peasant revolt, uh, peasant revolt, 100 years of wars, series sequence happened. And along with that, the most calamity, the most dangerous calamity that was what? The Black Death, right? The pandemic, the Black Death. So, it was this work is a concern about the state of England during that 14th century, which was marked by social unrest, political instability and the Black Death, the effects of Black Death. So, 14th century was a period of what uh, storms, right? Political instability, social unrest, so much civil wars and the effect of Black Death along with Peasant Revolt. Works Clementis is considered as an important work of Middle English literature and provides valuable insights into the intellectual and moral concerns of the time. So, this is a reflection of 14th century. Okay, this is a reflection of 14th century which marked the calamities, what the uh, negative effects or the pandemic of 14th century and it is so much concern. It reflects the concern about the social unrest, political instability and the effects of black death also. That is Vox Clementis. Then, another works. Yeah. Another one, another contemporary, contemporary of Geoffrey Chaucer, that is Sir John Mantville. So, in between we have one person that is John Wycliffe. So, sorry, that is Wycliffe. So, we will discuss about Wycliffe, the literary revival and such kind of things in the later. Okay, so another contemporary was Sir John Mantville, it is he is the he is the presumed pseudonymous author of the famous medieval travelogue titled The Travels of Sir John Mantville. So he is the pseudonymous author. He wrote a travelogue that is that is titled as The Travels of Sir John Mantville. This work, also known as The Travels of Sir John Ville Knight. So, this work is also known as The Travels of Sir John Mantville Knight. So, John Mantville is a pseudonymous author and he wrote a travelogue during that time that was what that was The Travels of Sir John Mantville Knight. And it was one of the most popular and widely read books of its time. So, most popular and widely read books. It describes what it describes it describes the adventures and travels of sir john mantville an english knight who claimed to have journeyed extensively throughout the known world in the 14th century so john mantville is the name of saint that, that is a titular character of this poem so he is a knight so the poet adopted that titular character as his pseudonym and we don't know about the real name of that poet, but we call him John Mandeville. That is a pseudonymous author. And this is the story of a knight, English knight named Sir John Mandeville, who claimed to have journeyed extensively, ex that is extensively through the, through the known through the known world in the 14th century. So this is about the adventures, the explores, that is the exploring of a knight that is of the known world in the 14th century. So that's all about John Manville and that's all about the contemporaries of Chaucer, the contemporaries of Chaucer. Okay, so we saw John Gower, William Langland and John Manville and their works okay in our uh, what in our 
batch life we will discuss the works in detail if you want to know the batch life sessions you can feel free feel free to call our counseling team and i think yeah this is pinned here in the comment box the contact number everything so i am taking the batch life for ugc net set for english language and literature so if you want to know more detail then call this number and that's all about today's session i hope you got all the things that is all the important things about the contemporaries of contemporaries of jaffrey chaucer so that's all guys any doubts any doubts in the session any doubts you can ask i will wait here you can ask for the doubt session yeah the chat box the chat box is open for you So, all right. So, that's all about our uh, today's session. So, guys, so let me wind up today's session. Yeah. Let me wind up today's session. So, guys, thank you so much for attending this session. And we will see you in the next session with yet another important topic. So, till then, bye bye. Keep watching. So do hard work, make the victory. Bye.